<laughs> well, we're glad to see all of you here this morning. We can come together again on this fine Tuesday to study God's Word. Appreciate your interest in hearing that Word. Appreciate uh, Brother Greg's interest in to proclaim that Word. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Greg is a graduate of Memphis School of Preaching. Currently preaching at the Newport News Church of Christ in Virginia. We're glad to have him here this week with us in the gospel meeting. We've been very blessed so far. The powerful word that he's been preaching. And indeed we expect no less today, Brother Greg. Thank you for coming. We're going at this time to ask Brother Randy Key if he would to come and say a word for us. And then Greg will take over from there. I love you, Father. We thank Thee for the day. We thank Thee for the opportunity now that we have to uh, gather and listen to Thy Word uh, taught to us and proclaimed. We're thankful now for our nation, the freedom that we have that allows us to do this without fear. So we pray that this will always be so. We're thankful for our speaker, his dedication, his soundness in the faith. We ask Thee to bless him as he uh, speaks to us. Help us to listen uh, in view of the value of our own soul and also in view of eternity. We thank Thee now for the congregation here that uh, has provided the gospel meeting this week for us. Forgive us now as we forgive others and help us to be faithful acceptably. These prayers and blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You want that one. <laughs> Good morning. Hopefully, this is going to work for us. We are studying on morning classes, biblical Christianity. What exactly is Christianity? But we are, we are thankfully, we have the word of God that assists us and helps us. So I thought what we do is, is we would define biblical Christianity this morning so we can make sure that we define it properly for God's word. Christian name that was given to the disciples, we find that in Acts chapter 11 and verse number 26. Now, when is the last time you read Acts chapter 11? 
you read Acts chapter 11, you'll find out some things about Christianity. We could have started there. Uh, you notice some of the things that the Christians were doing right there in that chapter, in verse number, in chapter um, 11. And, and you'll see that uh, even when you look at the things that they were doing that's enumerated in chapter 11, you can see sometimes that when you compare that to Christianity today, many have gotten away from the very things that they were doing in Christianity. A name, it is a name of which we should not feel ashamed. Uh, Peter describes that in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 16. If any man suffer as a Christian, not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. A name of which Paul was certainly not ashamed. He even attempted for Agrippa and others to be as he was. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. But what does it truly mean to be a Christian? What I'm going to do is I'm going to define it by certain words. Like, notice, if you think Christianity in faith, as it pertains to faith, it means to be a believer in Christ. Look at Acts chapter 16 and notice verse number 31. Chapter 16 and verse number 31. You see, to me, people can't even get off the runway because they don't understand faith. If you don't understand faith and how it pertains to Christianity, then, my friends, people are lost. Even try to begin the Christian faith. And so faith is a key. Faith is a key. But in faith, it means to literally be a believer in Christ. When this Philippian jailer asked what he must do to be saved, this is what he was told. Acts 16 and verse number 31. How does that read? So they said, well, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now that word believe is pissed you off. It means to have faith in. That is credit to entrust, especially one's spiritual well-being to Christ. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for some folks, when you start talking about belief, they think it's just simply uh, mental powers or mental industry, if you will. They simply just that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or they just believe and, as they say, accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But he said they were, that this individual was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul, in certain areas, would tell people to do certain things or different things at certain times. Um, Peter as well. When you look at the first gospel sermon that was preached in Acts chapter 2, when those folks wanted they had to do because they felt like there was nothing they can do. You really ought to think about Acts chapter 2. When those folks looked up to those disciples and said, men and brother, what shall we do? They don't believe there's anything they can do. They have now found out that they have killed the Lord and they have crucified the Christ. And so now, you know, in desperation, you, you can see in a panic, if you will, they say, well, what are we going to do? What, what, what shall we do? What can we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. But you will notice that Paul did not give that information to the jailer. Paul told him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I submit to you that they're telling them the exact thing. But Paul said, but Peter said, believe, you know, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because those folks have just got a, an entire lesson, an entire sermon on Christ and who he is, and certainly who he is in, pertaining to the past and to the prophets, and who he is now, and who he stands, who he stands as in relation to them pertaining to their salvation. So now they have Jesus. They have heard about Jesus and now it's just a matter of will you respond? But this Philippian jailer doesn't have that information. And so Paul has to first begin to tell him, well the first thing you have to do is to love and learn and trust in this Jesus Christ. And then he begins to teach him what he must do. And ultimately he will get to the same point as did Peter. He's telling him to believe, but he's not telling him based on just the historical if you will faith. As to believe in the Son of God and the Messiah, the one who has come into the flesh and has suffered and died and rose and is now in heaven at the right hand of God, would again come and judge the quick and the dead and eventually will allow people to have faith to salvation. All of that is good. That speaks exactly to who Christ is. But that's not enough. He doesn't want him to have simply a historical faith. He doesn't want him to simply just believe in these facts. He wants him to believe in the sense that he comes to trust him as the only one, 
One, he can, he can certainly give himself to, certainly one who he can serve. He has to accept him Messiah as the only means and the way to salvation. Well, he wants that individual to come to trust his immortal soul to this Christ. He wants more than understanding who he is. You see, when you start thinking about faith, when you start thinking about belief, when you start thinking about belief in Christ, it takes every part of a man to believe in Christ. All of his heart to believe in Christ. It's what the denominational world doesn't understand when they start to believe, when they start to speak about things pertaining to salvation. They don't understand that sometimes when the word believe is used for your intellect, it means you must believe intellectually. John chapter 8, 21 and 24. Let's go there and read that because that's what we're talking about. You've got a compartment in your heart known as the intellect. That intellect has so when we're talking about faith, we're talking about faith in Christ. You have to be a believer in Christ. But you have to believe with your whole person. You have to believe with your intellect. Believe with your intellect, what that means is you accept the words that are being spoken as fact, as truth. If you don't, you can't believe. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 21. Someone please. Now, give me 24. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die. Intellectual. They have to believe, they have to accept intellectually that what Jesus is saying is not only a fact, but it is truth, and they must believe intellectually. So in this component of a man's heart, if he's going to believe in God, he has to accept that the words that God has spoken are true. He has to accept those as fact. And he has to believe them. But that's not enough. You see, if the jailer just accept the fact that there was a Jesus and that he came and then he died and then he rose again, sent it back into heaven and that he was the Messiah, he is gone far enough. He has merely an intellectual faith. Not enough. But he also must have part of his will, the part of his constitution known as the will, must respond in faith. That's how we obey. So therefore, if there are some requirements, if God gave some requirements, not only do I believe who he is, and not only do I believe the facts that has been given to me, but I also believe with my will so that I might respond to whatever he requires of me. Denomination understand that. That's why when we start talking about things like obedience into the gospel, they miss it because they don't understand this is a part of faith. So when Jesus sends the, when he commissions the disciples out to go into all the gospel, he tells them what? Let's go to Mark 16, verse number 15 and verse number 16. And when you get there, just start reading. We're in class and we start hesitating, seeing if anybody else is going to start reading. Two of y'all read at the same time, just keep reading. Now, he that believes, got an ETH on the end of that word, right? His action, he continues to believe. But this is the part of him that speaks from his will. When you believe, you will repent and you will be baptized. You will do respond to what God requires. And so we have what is known as gospel obedience. We're responding from the heart. We're responding from the will. We are believing is what we There's a third aspect of belief that is absolutely necessary. It is called your, it is called your uh, emotion. Your emotions have to believe. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, sometimes when the Bible tells us to believe, we have to believe from our emotion. Look at chapter 14. John chapter 14. This is how man responds to God in belief. If you truly going to have faith, you have to believe. But you have to believe intellectually, you have to believe willfully, and you have to believe emotionally. Now, out of that emotion comes that trust. That's how we come to trust him. And that's what Jesus is asking of the disciples chapter 14. Now, the thing you need to realize before you get to John 14 is 13, chapter 13 came before it. 
it preceded it. And in chapter 13, Jesus is telling those disciples some serious things. He's telling those disciples. That, that, that they're going to, some things that they're going to do, he's telling them that he's going to have to go away. He won't be able to be with them and continue with them and all those kind of things. And whatever he's telling those disciples in John chapter 13, maddens those men. It really hurts them. And Jesus moves into chapter 14. And notice what he says in verse number one. Okay, so he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He's talking about emotional belief. He is telling them to trust in him. That's what he's telling them. You trust in God, trust in me. That's the part of man's constitution known as his emotion, where he has to now trust God. Every one of them is important. Now, the disciples are gloomy days, are they not? They're headed for some difficult times. And they're going to have to stand and they're going to have to rely on Christ who's sending them and commissioning them out. And he tells them all the difficult things. that. They're doing. But he's telling them, look, I'm going away. But I assure you, one day I will return and I will take you back with me. I'm going to prepare these places for you up there and I'm going to go prepare them for you and when I come again I will receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Now when those days come where those men are under persecution where they are, where they are troubled on every side and perplexed and all of these things are going on you know what's going to help them? That trust that one day Jesus is coming back as he promised to take us with him and I tell you what that's going to get them through. That's going to see them through. So how does it work for us? When you hear the gospel preached, intellectually, those are words being spoken. And intellectually, you either going to accept those words as fact, as truth, or you're not. Deny God's words and do not accept them and believe intellectually, you don't have to go any further. You reject that, nothing else is going to help you. But if you accept that and do not going to help you. So when he says these words, you accept them intellectually. And so that's what we all did. We heard that gospel, and I tell you what, it spoke to us. And we we, we, we looked at the evidence, we weighed out everything, and man, the, the clouds began to move from our heads, and we're like, wow, this is it. And then we had to enact the will. Because in those words, he said, here's what you need to do so I can give you salvation. And enacted that will, and we did what he required. We obeyed. Then we find ourselves in Christ, and now I have to go live. And now I need to trust him for the direction of my life and all the things that he requires. I have to trust him. And what gets me through those difficult times? What those dark days, what helps me sometimes when I'm feeling down and I want to give up? Trust in Jesus that he says one day I'm coming back and I'm going to take you to heaven with me. Every part of our hearts are involved when it comes to belief in him. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6 verse 28 and 29. The Lord gave a similar answer to the Jews but they were not asking with the same sincerity and affection as was the Philippian jailer. Notice what they asked in John 6, 28, and read verse 29 as well. Now the Philippian jailer said, what I do to be saved? Here the Jews are asking Jesus, what must we do to me what we might work the works of God? But they're not as sincere as that Philippian jailer, are they? How does Jesus respond? See, they require, they, they inquire as to the works of God in a plural sense. You know, how many things can we do? You know, what, what do we have to do? Do I have to do a little bit of this? It's like folk who come to the church and they think that somehow they got to get their ticket punched on all these little things that they can do. Well, you know what? I, 
I attend Sunday morning Bible class. I, I, I'm here on Sunday evening. I, I, I'm here on Sunday morning. And I, I even come on Wednesday night Bible study. Oh, I take the Lord's Supper. They celebrate things as if that is the saying all of their Christianity. Those things don't save. Those things don't save at all. You get the Lord's Supper. What is it? Absolutely. It wasn't intended to save you. If you think about what this is, this way, it's an opportunity for God to give me something tangible, something physical, something I can touch, something I can do to express inwardly my devotion to him. So it always comes back to this. Always comes back to the inside. So if he gives me some physical things that represent something, I get a chance to express by those things my inward devotion. If I mess up the inward, that the external things don't help me. Don't assist me at all. It's like having that belief in him, but that belief in him is only intellectual. If it does not feel, if it does not touch the emotion. So that I can express love to him. So that I can obey him and respond to him. Then my friend, sexual belief is no good. I can do a lot of things. But still not love him from the heart. So I can enact the will without the emotion. But if a man truly going to be pleasing unto God. In faith. Christianity means to be a real believer. In Christ. They want to know how many things. Jesus says one thing is necessary. And what is that one thing? Read it again. Verse 29. What is that one thing Jesus says is necessary? This is the work of God. What is his work? That ye believe in him. You see, some folks, that means, you know what, we just believe in Jesus. All you got to do is believe in Jesus. Now, I just told you what belief meant. You see, belief gets in every part of who you are. Belief gets to your intellect. Belief gets to your will. Belief gets to your emotion. It becomes every, it, it gets to every part of who you are. So, therefore, my friends, when he says, this is the work of God, that on the Son. You believe on me. What he is saying is every part of you is required in that belief. So Jesus covered everything simply saying one thing. No, they want to compartmentalize some things. Oh, if I do this, I'm spiritual. That's the way folks do it today, isn't it? But Jesus got to the heart of it. Oh, every part of you are going to be involved in this belief. To believe in Jesus as our only Savior is the goal of the gospel. Look at John 20, verse 30 and 31. John 20, verse 30 and 31. This is the goal of the gospel, to believe in Jesus and believe in him alone. How is it stated in John? So we say the goal of the gospel is to believe in Jesus Christ. To believe in Jesus Christ, only Savior, is the goal, is the purpose of the gospel. In other words, my friends, you and I must be indoctrinated with doctrine these days. Has the church gone away from preaching doctrine? Have we gotten away from those things? You know, folks act like doctrine is But we need to be indoctrinated. That's exactly, that's what we preachers are trying to do. We're trying to indoctrinate the church. I don't want to hear what folks want to believe. I'm going to tell you based on the word of God. This is what you ought to believe. Because that's the way God is. He tells us what we ought to believe. He tells us what we need to believe. He tells us what we should believe. And if we don't believe, then we're going to be judged by those things. 48 is in the Bible. Jesus said, he that rejected me and received not my word had one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You know what that means? I need to be indoctrinated. 
fascinated by the word of God. In fact, that's why 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 is in the Bible. Paul says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. Aphelimos is that word. It's profitable. That means it's advantageous. It's helpful. For doctrine. To tell us what we ought to believe. To indoctrinate us in the doctrine of God. For reproof, for correction, for instruction that the man of God might be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. We need to be indoctrinated. Every preacher in here understands that's our responsibility to indoctrinate the church. So we have to preach the doctrine, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we might indoctrinate the church because in Christianity, when you think about faith, it means to be a believer in Christ. To believe in all that he is about. And I tell you what, the word of God is advantageous, it's helpful, it's useful for indoctrinating people. And that's exactly what we ought to do. Let's notice, let's go behind curtain number two. Find out what it means to be a Christian. What, is, what does it mean? In relationship, it means to be children of God. Look at John chapter 1. And notice verse 11 through verse number 13. Now, I've got quite a few of these. I don't know how many I'm going to get through, but we got two days. to see how many we can cover. I hope I can cover three of them today. We'll see. Verse number 11 through 13. Someone please begin at verse number 11. Hold on right there. He came unto his own what? He came unto his own land. Is what he did. Came unto his own land and his, his own people. Look up those words when you get a chance. He came unto his own land and his own people did not receive him. And this is a people that God had chosen above all other people. Giving him his laws and favoring them. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse you're taking notes, Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse number 2. God had chosen them to be a special people unto him. But they received him not. They did not accept him as the Messiah. They did not obey his voice. They rejected him, despised him, and ultimately killed him. He came to a broad net. He came to his own world. The world of which he was the light. John chapter 1 and verse number 9. The world which was created by him. John chapter 1 verses 3 through 5. By his incarnation he became an inhabitant of the world that he created. And you know the inhabitants of the world that he created didn't even know him. Now think about the infant being born into the arms of his own creature. You ever thought about that? Jesus made <laughs> Mary existed because of Jesus. And now Jesus is born into Mary's arms. God then is born into the arms of his own creature. Think of the man, Christ, breathing his own air, trotting upon or treading upon the ground that he made, being sustained by the very elements he created, living among men, walking among the very elements of nature that was made by him. And even walking and living in the shadow of death. death. Think of him subjecting himself to his own creature. And the creature treating him to the point of putting him to death. And that death was to man's salvation. Man was in the presence of his maker. 
And the Bible says of him, the world that he made knew him not. John 1, 11, he came into his own, but his own received him not. But what about verse number 12? Now let's break that down. Those who received him, John 1 and verse number 12. Receive him is the Greek word lambano. It means to accept. Those who accept him. You hear the world say sometimes, you know, just accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Well, he says to those who receive him or those who accept him, he gave them the power. But notice this. Those who accept him as he is offered to them, in the gospel. That's how you accept him. How he is presented to us in the gospel. However he is presented to us in the gospel, then that's how I accept him or that's how I receive him. Man must, re must receive him as the eternal word. Man must receive him as the son of God. Man must receive him as the Messiah. Man must receive him as the Savior. Man must receive him only redeemer. You see, when man receives him, the Bible says he gave them the power. The exousia. He gave them the power. That word means the right. The privilege. He gave them the right. He gave them the privilege. He gave them the power. He gave them the strength. He gave them the freedom. He gave them the authority. That means to become the sons of God. Now that word power that we, we just defined, exousia. Look at how it's used in a few different passages. Look at how it's used in five and verse number four. So we can get a real good sense of this word. When he says he gave them the power. Well, this is how it's used in Acts chapter five and verse number four. You remember this account, Ananias and Sapphira. When you get there, please read verse number four. While I remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own? Did I, miss the, did I miss the word power? Okay. So, was it not in your same control? Was it not your right? Was it not your privilege? Did you not have control over that particular thing? Isn't that what he's saying to Ananias and Sapphira? It was your right. You had the freedom to do desire to do with that, but you chose to do the wrong thing. But it was in your power. You could have just simply said, hey, I'm going to give half of this. But instead, they attempted to consider it a little more benevolent than they truly were. And so that constituted deception and a lie. Look at Romans chapter 9, and verse number 24. And someone else gives chapter 7, and verse number 37. How does Romans 9, 24 read? Even those of whom he has That may not be the verse I'm looking for, but that's all right. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 37. How does that read? Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, having but over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep the virgin and do it well. So he has power over his own will. He has the freedom. He has the right. Over his own will. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9. And notice how the word is translated there. First Corinthians 8 and verse number 9. How does that read? So that's that word. Liberty. Exousia. That's that word that's in John 1.12 that's translated power. So he gave them the right. He gave them the power. He gave them the freedom. He gave them the liberty. Now, when he says in John, after John chapter 1 and verse number 12, 
to those who received him, to them, he gave the power, he gave the liberty, the right, the privilege. Jesus, my friends, it is every man's, woman, boys, and girls, God-given right. God-given right to become children of God is rejected. Everyone has the right. Everyone has the privilege. And no one can take that away from us. Every one of us have the right and the privilege to obey Jesus Christ. Every one of us have the same right and privilege and liberty to become the children of God. Because in Christianity, if we're going to have a relationship, it means that we are children of God. And he gave us the right to become the sons of God. We are the sons of God because we have been adopted by him. First John chapter 1, verse number 1. We are the sons of God because we resemble him and have his same spirit. We are the sons of God because we are united with him. And he regards us as brethren. Isn't it good to know that God regards us as brethren? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 11, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Matthew chapter 25, and verse number 40. We have been called, kaleo, we have been called, named, the children of God. What a wonderful privilege to wear such a glorious title. To them who believe on his name, when you think about believing on his name, the name is often put for the person represents the person. So when you believe on his name, you believe and accept all that Christ is. Everything about Christ we accept. But even here when we believe on his name, we're not just believing on a name as it were, as if it does not have anything to do with the person. We are believing on the person. We are believing on him. We are believing on his office. We are believing we are believing in everything about him, and that's what we accept. We want all that Christ is about. We're not like sometimes people who want to have something because something is missing in their bait or something like that. You know, they look over someone else and, you know, my husband, he goes with me to garage sales and we do all those things. Well, I wish my husband did that. You see, to get him, you have to have all that comes with him. And there may be a whole lot of foolishness. He might go to garage sales, but that's my, that might be all you do. Oh, well, my husband, he waits with me at the stores patiently. He never complains, and he just sits there. And I'm able to shop in his shoes. So, oh, I wish my husband did that. You want it? Because that may be all you get. Who knows all the foolishness that's attached so when we get Jesus, guess what folks try to do? They try to compartmentalize Jesus as if they're going to accept things about him, things about him, but other things they can do without. But if you accept Jesus Christ, you have to accept his doctrine. So he is the Christ. Think about Christ with his body. You know what? Keep his head on his body. Remove the head. Why? Because they don't want to do what he says. They don't want to follow his headship. They don't want to follow his leadership. But if you're going to accept Jesus, keep his tongue in his mouth. He speaks doctrine. But folks want Jesus, but they don't want his doctrine. They don't want to do what he requires. You want Jesus to the head and not accept the body, but that's exactly what folks do. They want Jesus. They want the head. Oh, I love Jesus, but they don't want the body because they don't want his church. I don't believe in organized religion. And I don't believe in church, one body. So they want Christ's head, but they don't want the body. Take his feet off because he walks a certain way. He agrees with certain things. Take away his mind. He likes people with a certain type of character. He doesn't just walk with anybody. You won't find the Lord just hanging out with anybody. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, you're going to have Jesus if you're going to walk with him. But folks say they want Jesus, but they don't want what he's all about. But see, that's what this is all about. To them who believe on his name, when you believe his name, you believe on everything about him because the name stands for him. Let me give you a couple of passages. I wrote down a few scriptures if you want to write them down. John chapter 2 and verse number 20. If you're taking notes. John chapter 3 and verse number 38. John 3 verse 18 rather. And first John chapter 5 and verse number 13. The name is for the man. 
in biblical Christianity. In relationship, it means to be children of God. But what's behind curtain number three? In communion, it means to be a friend of God. Oh, we're going to get rid of a whole lot of folk right here. A friend of God. Look at John chapter 15. A friend of God. That word friend is philos. And it means to be a dear friend. Actively fond. You are fond of your friend. That's how you make a friendship. Just a moment. <clears throat> John 15 and verse number 14, someone please. How dare Jesus put stipulations on your friendship. The audacity. Right? That's where you feel? Now when the last time someone said to you, now I'll be your friend, but here's the conditions. You're like, well, forget it, dude. That, isn't that our attitude? That's the way folks feel. You can't put stipulations on my being your friend. I'll be your friend, but you know what? If you don't, then we gotta, you gotta agree to this. Otherwise, I'm not and the first thing you say is you're not going to be my friend then because I'm not going to be a friend based on all your stipulations. You know what? You might do that with each other, but you're equal. But we are not equal to the Lord. There's a superior talking to an inferior. And that superior decides, he decides the stipulations. That's for the standard. You and I must agree. So Jesus said, ye are my friends if you do what? Listen about the friendship. If you're going to have communion with God in Christianity, it means to be a friend of God. But the friendship is predicated obedience. That's what it's predicated upon. There's a whole lot of folks trying to be with Christ and calling themselves Christians, but they are not Christians in the sense, in the biblical sense, because they don't obey Him. They don't live for Him. They don't respond to Him in gospel obedience. And they certainly do not allow Him to rule their lives and their actions. They are not led by the gospel of Jesus. Philippians 1 and verse number 27. And so therefore they are not Christians. You see, anybody can be a Christian when the world starts defining it, but when we start defining it biblically, oh, we separate the men from the boy. You are a friend of God predicated on your obedience. That's what Jesus is getting off, getting across to those disciples. Now, back up to verse number three. Greater love, Jesus says, have no man, the man lay down his life for his friend. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, I've proven my friendship. Hasn't he? Already proved my friendship. How did I prove my friendship? I died for you. That's how I proved my friendship. How are you going to prove your friendship? I'm going to live for you. Amen. Predicated upon obedience. Romans 5, verse number 7 and 8. Verse number 6, rather. For when we were with in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God committed toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ tells those disciples, there's no greater love than a man, he will lay down his life. And then he says, ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I tell you, whatsoever I command you. Now, we prove ourselves a friend. We prove ourselves a friend by giving up our lives in submission to his will for his Matthew chapter 16 and notice verse number 25. Matthew chapter 16 25. Are you a friend of Jesus? 
Are you actively fond of Him? Are you a dear friend? How does Matthew 16 read? Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Come on, read. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Your life. He's not talking about being murdered and martyred. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about losing your physical life. He's talking about losing that other life. He's talking about losing anything that you consider dear to yourself that will put you at odds with him. He's talking about giving up whatever you have to give up in this life to live for him. It's what Paul did. Philippians chapter 3. He lost his life. It's what he did. He gave it up. Go to Philippians chapter 3 and see an example of one who lost his life. That's what he's talking about. You're going to seek to save your life? There's a whole lot of people who gave their lives to the detriment of the cause of Christ. But Paul lost his life, gave up his life for the cause of Christ. He took on a new Philippians chapter 3. Let's begin at about verse number seven. What you say? But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Come on, read. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Did the man give up his life? He lost his life. He had already enumerated all the things that he had in the flesh. The man could have been going straight to the Sanhedrin court. He could have been the highest law of the land. He could have certainly had wealth and fame and all those kind of things. He was certainly that man. But he said, I gave all of that up. I've counted all things lost. For what? So that I might gain Christ. And that's what Paul did. A one, a one who lost his life. And in losing his life, he ultimately saved his life. He's going to have eternal life because he lost his life for Christ. We had to give up that life in the world, didn't we? We had to give it up. We had to let it go. And some of those things that, that we were doing and some of the ways in which we were living and some of the directions heading. We had to give all of that up. We had to let that go. And don't you know some people are presented with the gospel of Jesus Christ and they just can't let go of their life that they're living. Just can't let it go. They will not lose their life in Christ. The disciples certainly did, didn't they? When Jesus met them, those men were fishermen. Jesus said, I got a new occupation for you. You no longer fish for fish. You're going to fish for men. And they lost that life and followed Jesus. We appear, friends, by cheerful obedience to him. Go back to John chapter 15 and verse number 14. John 15. And notice verse number 14. Here's how we appear as friends. Friendship predicated upon obedience. John 15, 14. How does that read? Now, go to chapter 14 and verse number 15. If you love me, keep my oh, my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, you a friend of God? Prove it. You're a Christian? This is what it means. Now, we've talked about just a few things here, and already. You can understand why the world don't understand Christianity. You can understand. They don't get this. Have they responded to God with all of their heart? Every part of their hearts? Or have they missed some parts? Are they Christians being friends of God because of obedience? Jesus is the requirement. He's the one that sets the requirement. And he says, if you're going to be my friend, you're going to have to obey me. And Christ showed his friendship. By not only dying, but also by revealing his mind. Look at John 15 and verse number 15. He revealed his mind to those disciples. That's a wonderful show of friendship. Come on, read. No longer do I call you servants, for I have learned to know you by 
What you say? You remember why? You remember one thing about Abraham? Abraham was said to be a friend of God. God was a friend to Abraham. And you know what? He revealed his mind to Abraham. That's what friends do. Now, let me ask you this regarding your business, your personal business, some things that's very near and dear to you, some things that sometimes you don't to know, but who do you reveal them to? Y'all can talk. Who would you tell some of those things? No, I'm talking about people. To your wife. And what is she? A friend. And when you have a close friend, sometimes you share things with that friend that you don't share with everyone else. Isn't because there's some trust there. There's some confidence in that friend. And sometimes when you have that close and near and dear friend, you might share some personal things with that friend because they are your friend. I assure you that's why you do it, because you don't just randomly go out and tell anybody some things concerning your situation or your problems or what have you. You don't just tell them, let me just tell everybody. No. When folks say something wrong with you. I had a man come into the congregation not long ago, probably about four or five months ago. He came into the congregation to visit. I noticed him when he walked in. Pretty stout fella and tall. And he walked up front and I'm preaching when he got there and and, and, and after services, we're, we're eating and everything. And, and this brother had folk in the auditorium. And he is telling them all of his problems and all of his business, his wife's business. And he's in there and them sisters didn't know what to do. And this boy is just everything out. And they said, the sisters got so nervous, you need to talk to Brother Greg. You need to talk to Brother Greg. And he's just going on and on. See, when he did that, See, you don't do that. That's not normal. Something's wrong. This man is hurting. He's willing to tell anybody who will listen all the things pertaining to his business. Well, I am in the office and ended up getting his wife into my office because they were not members of our congregation. They were members somewhere else. Somewhere else. But he was looking for some help any way he could find it. When I finally got him in the office, I said, man, don't you ever do that. Don't ever go and tell everybody your business and put that out in front of everybody. You come and talk to someone that you can talk to, and we can get you some answers and hopefully get you some results. But don't you ever again. Number one, your wife didn't deserve that. And now that I've been talking to you for 15 minutes, I can know why she's crazy. And I absolutely did say that. I've been listening to you for 15 minutes, and I'm already starting to wonder about myself. So I know she didn't get, she didn't been driven crazy. I said, don't you ever do that again. Okay, 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 you know. But we try to help him. But listen, Jesus tells the disciples, I told you all of these things because you're my friends. That's why I'm telling you. See, Jesus showed his friendship. It's not like what happened in the Old Testament church, Acts chapter 7, verse number 38. They were utilized more as servants and did not know the true counsels of God. They desired to look into those things. But you think about in contrast to the Old Testament church versus the New Testament church. And then you hear people, all things. We've been given all things. We know all things. Hey, I'll tell you what, it's good to be in the New Testament church because we're friends. Jesus even describes John the Baptist versus one in the church. And he says, of a man, of, 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 of men born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. But he that is in the kingdom, least in the kingdom, is greater than he. What a privilege it is to be in the church, in the kingdom, where God has done all things unto us. Unlike the servants under the Old Testament system that didn't get everything revealed unto them. Jesus tells the disciples, but you are my friends and I've told you all things. Paul says to the Ephesian church, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me. The mystery, which I wrote for in few words, where you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto us, holy apostles and prophets, the Spirit. Jesus shows wonderful friendship by revealing things unto us. Now, he's a God in communion. 
pertaining to Christianity based on his obedience, but also based on James chapter 4 and verse number 4 quickly. Do we stop at 11? Okay. Have five minutes. I think we're going to finish this. All right. James chapter 4 and verse number 4. A friend of God predicated on allegiance. Obedience and allegiance. How does it read? Know ye not is an appeal to their sense of reflection. James uses the verb oida, which means to know by reflection instead of the common word gnosko, which means to know by observation. So he says, know ye not. I need you to use your sense of reflection. And when you use your sense of reflection and your perception, it shall lie you to the conclusion that one cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. Sometimes we tell people, use your common sense. Think. Just think about it. Paul said that to the brethren. You might miss it if you don't, if you don't pay attention. Ephesians chapter 3. But Paul said, whereby when you read, you may know. They need to just simply go back to what he had just wrote. Whereby when you read, Reflect that. Think about the things that I've written unto you and you will understand. That's what Paul is saying to them. I've already written it to you. But sometimes when you're reading, and, and I know this is, this is true of me, you can be reading for a while, you can be reading for a while, you forget what you read. And you have to go back. Isn't that terrible? Wait a minute. i got to go back. And don't try to read at night before you go to bed because that just doesn't help. You didn't get a chance to pick up the Bible all day and you finally get the and it's 11.30 at night and you're tired in a long day but you feel guilty because I haven't studied my Bible like you're really about to study now. You need to just go on to bed and pray God and, 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 and look forward to another day. together. But you you in the bed and you done picked up the Bible and next day you keep doing, going like this. And Now tell me what you accomplished. Absolutely nothing. And so that's what you're reading. You just can't remember what you already read. So Paul was telling them, go back. Go back. And read what I've already wrote, and then you will begin to understand. So he uses the word. He wants them to use their perception. And they will understand that the friendship of the world is opposed to God. The differences between the two are so opposed to one another that there can never be any harmony between the two when you start talking about the friendship of the world and God. So proper discernment of sin does not require for us to in order to understand its effects. So know you not that the friendship of the world. Why are you going to be a friend to the world? Well, I just need to get out there and see for myself. Isn't that what our young foolish people want to do? I just need to get out there and see for myself. Sometimes they even say to their parents, well, you made a mistake. Yeah. What, that, what does that have to do with you? Well, I just need to get out there and see for myself. You don't have to participate in sin to find out how bad it is. You don't have to participate in a thing to find out of this devastation. That's just like saying, you know what, I need to drink a little poison just to find out what it's really going to do. They just told you the label was going to do. Why you have to drink it? I can read the label and know you should not swallow this poison. You better consult a doctor or a physician immediately because it can be harmful to your health and it could lead to your death, leading up to your death. Well, when I read it, I don't want to have, I don't want to digest, I don't want anything to do with any poison. I don't have to drink it to find out. I read it. Isn't that right? That's right. Friend of God, predicated on allegiance. One God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul. And when one takes the affection that he owes to God, and he casts it upon things of this world, he to be disloyal. And therefore, he is in league with the world, which puts him at odds with God. You know what the world has done? The world has lined, aligned themselves on the other side of the back. 
they are on that side of the battlefield. God is over there. And they have decided to take up the opposite side of that battlefield against God. And what James is saying, why in the world do you claim to be for God? To be a friend of God and align yourself with it. That doesn't make good sense, does it? Jesus points out that God and mammon cannot be loved by the same person at the same time. Matthew chapter 6, 24. If one is to love the other, if one is to love one, the other is hated. If one accepts the other, then obviously the other is rejected. God says the affection for this world must be done away. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. John said, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all the lust of the flesh, lust of life, and the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but is of the world. Don't love what about this world? The maxims that govern it, the principles that run it, the ends that are sought, the amusements and gratification that characterizes it in contradiction to God. Again, Paul's statement in Romans 12 is, is, is really I'm good here, Romans 12, 1 and 2. We have presented our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And Jesus, or Paul rather, says that is your reasonable service. Are you a friend? Let me give you a few questions and then the lesson is yours. I put forth this little test to the church there and just ask these questions and therefore your contemplation. Are you a friend of God? Have you cast your affections on the world? Are you a friend of God? Do you find your chief delight? Are you conformed to the world and the things which distinguishes it from the church? Some people love those very things the church can't go along with. They need to check themselves, don't they? Are you seeking and finding your relationships among the world rather than among Christians? I've heard people say that awful statement time and time again. Well, my best friends are in the world. Well, you have a serious problem. Because sadly, that's true of too many so-called Christians. I don't have any friends in the world. I got rid of them a long time ago. Friends are right here. And I like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. When told that his family was outside. Jesus looked at those who were listening to us. Those who were his disciples. And he says, who are my mother? Who are my brethren? Jesus was concerned about those who are concerned about the word of God. So when your best friends are in the world, my friends, I tell you what, they don't expect much. They don't require much. And maybe that's why. It's the path of least resistance. Do you prefer the scenes of the amusements of the world to the scenes where spiritually minded Christians find their happiness? I remember a time when gospel meetings was going on and we would fill the place. We would fill the building, would we not? Congregations from all over would be participating, coming to the gospel meetings. And now, if there's no form of entertainment, you get more folks out to have a big old singing you, if you if you got some entertainers coming from all over the brotherhood and they coming in with their different groups and all this kind of stuff, oh, you'll fill the building then for some good old singing, feel good clapping and shouting and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the preaching of the gospel, the just plain set for truth of the gospel that's going to help people's souls, folks don't show up anymore like that. Find their amusements elsewhere. Do you sacrifice your religious interest for worldly interest? We are witnessing professing Christians sacrifice no worldly interest for religion. But far too often religion is sacrificed for worldly interest. How many Christians have stayed home and missed the worship of God as if they as if God ever allowed that? They missed the worship of God because family and friends come show up. They're gonna spend the weekend with them and they don't typically come to worship and you find the Christian all Christian staying home to entertain their family. Well, I had some guests show up. Well, bring them with you or leave them there. And if they crooks, lock the door and tell them to wait till you get 
Amen. But what we don't do is not come worship our God because he commands it. When God great divisions of the human family, I have to ask myself, will I be found to have been a friend of the world or a friend of God, a goat or a sheep? Will I be among his friends or will, be, will I be accounted among his foes? Biblical Christianity in communion, it means to be a friend of God. But it's always based on obedience and it's always based on allegiance. Thank you for your wonderful and kind attention. Uh, Brother Vice is on his way, but like always, if you have any comments you want to make or any questions you want to ask, we'll give you an opportunity right now. We're all in agreement. Thank you. Again, we're thankful that all of you are here this morning. What a fine lesson that was. Oh, I tell you what, we children of God, we need to be in communion and be that friend that He would have us to be. Uh, Brother Benji, would you come and lead us in a closing prayer, please? As he comes, we want to invite you to come back tonight, 7 p.m., to hear another good lesson from Brother Greg, and then tomorrow morning again at 10 and Wednesday evening at 7. That's fine. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for today. We thank you, my Lord, for the word that we're able to hear this morning. I pray, my Lord, that you'll continue to share as we apply it to our lives and that we'll be able to go out and share with those that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis. Father, we thank you for Greg. We ask that you'll be with him and his family, that you'll strengthen them. Help him, dear Lord, as he the word. And Father, for this beautiful congregation that you'll continue to be with them in the great work that they're doing here. Now, my Lord, be with us as we depart from this place, but never from your presence. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.